Hi, I'm Raymond Peck from Alteryx uh, Innovation Labs, and um, we're here today for ML101, What is Machine Learning and What Can It Do for Me? I'll be making some forward-looking statements in today's talk. These forward-looking statements are subject to change. Please don't make any purchase decisions based on these forward-looking statements, but only on the features that currently exist in our products. So this is the first of three sessions uh, about machine learning, and they're really geared toward people who either have little to no experience with machine learning or are self-taught beginners and may not have picked up on some of the subtleties. These talks are focused on things that are practical and necessary to do successful machine learning projects and to develop, to develop intuitions, um, not to dig into math and uh, statistics that are unnecessary for um, doing successful products. And there's a big emphasis in these talks on helping you avoid common potholes and landmines, potholes being things that are fairly easy to see if you're looking out for them. And landmines are problems that um, you know, are a little diff more difficult to find and you have to dig down into a little bit. The third session really focuses on that topic. So the aim of this session, ML101, is to look at the kinds of business problems that machine learning can address and can help you with on a day-to-day -day basis and get an understanding of the general shape of the data that we're going to use. So what is machine learning really? It's all about software that finds patterns in data and then either allows you to get some understanding of your data from those patterns that it found or to build models which allow you to make predictions. Um, those predictions can either be numeric predictions, um, predicting something like a revenue or a classification predictions. Uh, machine learning of this type is also used for finding anomalies and for grouping, but we're not going to cover those in these sessions. So what kinds of questions can machine learning help answer? Um, like I mentioned briefly, really we're talking here about numeric prediction. Um, or classification. A numeric prediction, things like uh, predicting a, a um, continuous number, and classification meaning predicting uh, that something is within two or more classes. And we really break those apart into what's called binary classification, which is predicting um, something that falls into two different classes, true or false, fraud or not fraud, and uh, multi-class classification. So, um, something that can fall into a number of classes, usually under 100, between 3 and 100. So the first question that we have to ask when we're starting out on a machine learning project is, do we have appropriate data? Machine learning uh, algorithms need tabular data, and we'll go into what that means in a minute, um, and that data has to have representative examples, examples that um, represent the same kind of data that you're going to see in the future and it, they have to have the answers. So we're looking at historical data for which we know the right result, and then we want to find patterns um, that help us predict that result for new data that we see in the future. We also need columns or features that we think are going to be predictive of the thing that we're trying to predict. Um, another a aspect of uh, appropriateness of data is that especially when we're dealing with financial data or data about people that we want to make sure that we don't have unintended bias in our model and we want to make sure that we could recognize it if we do. A uh, sort of canonical example of this is that a postal code might be a proxy for race and if we're making decisions based um, on that for somebody's loan applications or fraud detection, we have to be very careful to do the right thing. Um, so the next really important part of this is understanding what the success criteria will be for the project. How would we quantify this? And the reason this comes into play is that how we measure the performance of the models that we build depends on what the use case is. And so we have different ways of measuring how our model is doing. We want to think beforehand what kind of um, outcome we want. So, you know, here's an example where if we have uh, financial data and we're trying to detect 
terrorists in the financial data, we can tolerate a lot of false positives that we have to investigate because we really want to find all the terrorists. Whereas if we're looking for fraud, there's a balance between the cost of investigating um, transactions that are flagged as fraud and um, uh, allowing fraud to go through. And so you know, how we evaluate how our model is doing and how we tune our model is going to vary. Right? Um, so it's important to think through what this success criteria is, exactly what we want to, to detect. So the next thing we need to think about is um, the process that we're going to use to put our model into use. Now, um, if we're using machine learning just to get insight into our data, uh, this might not be something that we have to concerns our, concern ourselves with too much. But if we are trying to use our model in a production situation, um, whether that's something that somebody runs manually or if it's um, going to fit into a production environment and be run automatically, uh, we have to think about how the model is going to fit into our business workflow. So how are we going to get input into the model? How are we going to get predictions to the people that need them? How are we going to monitor the performance of the model over time? And um, collecting new data over time. We'll get into this um, a bit more in the 103 session, but um, we want to make sure that we monitor the performance of the model when it's in production and make sure that it continues to perform. So here's an example that comes from a real customer that I had in a previous life, which was a large um, hospital group, one of the largest hospital groups in the U.S., and um, in all of these sort of, you know, hospital groups, clinics, sepsis infections are a problem. And, you know, the uh, medical establishment is trying to reduce the number of these sepsis infections that people get when they're, um, when they're admitted to a hospital. You can think of two different ways of taking medical data about a patient or a bunch of patients and using them to detect sepsis. The first is... You know, do we want to understand where sepsis is coming from and modify the way that our hospital is running to reduce the number of infections? Um, or do we want to make predictions for a particular patient, right? So how, uh, the first thing to think about is, you know, are we talking here in these two different cases about understanding or prediction? The first one is understanding, the second is prediction. And then the second thing that we have to think about is, how do these two cases differ in getting input to the model, the timeliness of getting the predictions out, and those kind of issues? So let's um, talk about the data, right? What do we mean by tabular data? So machine learning models, as I said before, need a single, single rectangular input table with a fixed number of rows and columns when we go through this process and we train our model. Each of the columns needs to be of a fixed specific type and have one specific meaning. So um, a simple spreadsheet, a single database table, a CSV file, these can all be examples of tabular data. So here's an example of a nicely formatted um, table of data. We have a sales price on the right, which is the thing that we're trying to predict. This is um, uh, information about diamonds. And we have a number of columns here which um, describe the diamonds, each of these diamonds, where each row is one diamond. We notice that we have this ID column, um, which is not going to be useful for making predictions, right? Um, so we'll want to eliminate that ID column as we go forward. Then we have this cut column, uh, which has missing data. So we'll talk later about how uh, to handle missing data. Um, but you can see that this is pretty well formed. So the next step, you know, often in our, um, our business situation, we have what's called relational data, right? So relational data is more than one table that's connected in some way. So our data may be across a number of tables and files, and um, each can contain a specific aspect of our problem. But they are connected through some identifiers, right? I might have a customer ID, I might have a store ID, things like this, and I'll have information about, a lot of information about customer, 
or a lot of information about a store, and all of these different data sources are connected by these IDs, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that all the data is in a relational database. I can also have data in files, um, but they're connected with each other through these IDs. And we may need to combine these and uh, join them together or merge or blend, however you want to call it, and aggregate data. So here's an example of um, relational data that could be from a, um, an internet and telephone provider. So you see here that we have kind of at the center of things, we have a customer. A customer has a certain ID. And we have demographics for that customer, which, is, which would also be joined by that ID, and a service area for them. And then the customer has a number of devices and those devices, here a phone and a router, they may be, may be more than one, um, they have associated data. So we have call log data for the telephone, uh, we have errors and usage for the internet router, um, and then the customer also uh, subscribes to a certain service package and they have some interactions with the support system, they may have chat support and telephone support, um, they also may have um, access to the website and you know some of those visits may have been about um, you know looking at the service packages that are available or contacting support so all this data can be used for a number of different use cases so you know let's think about those so let's take um, 20 seconds and think about what use cases we might have for that data, what questions we might want to ask of that data. And keep those questions in mind as we go through the rest of the presentation. So let's look at uh, three different potential use cases. We'll dig a little bit uh, more into the first one and then breeze through the second and third a little bit more quickly. So the first one that came to my mind was predicting customer churn. This is a very common use case for this kind of data. We have a subscriber, and we want to make sure that they don't leave our service and go somewhere else um, to one of our competitors. So <clears throat> thinking about what might be predictive of churn, you know, we have things like how many errors are they getting on their internet connection? How many telephone calls are getting disconnected? Right? Um, how many connections to support are they making? Are they chatting with support a lot? Uh, what is the text content of those chats? Um, does it seem like they're uh, happy at the end or upset at the end of those interactions? Um, same thing with the phone calls. We might take the audio and uh, convert it to text and have the same questions about it. And you know, how often have they visited, visited the support web pages? And, then looking at what are the trends over time. Are those issues getting worse or getting better? And we see that we have distilled from um, this set of tables that we saw before, we've distilled down a certain number of features which are um, aggregated across a lot of interactions that the customer has. So the next potential uh, use case we have is sort of similar, but in a way, it's opposite, predicting upsell. So we have a sales organization. Uh, we would like them to upsell the customers to the next level of service. But obviously, some customers are more open to, um, to upsell. So we might look at things like how often the customer is hitting their speed limit. Um, and you can see this first customer is hitting their speed limit quite a bit. Um, and you know, similarly, um, the second customer is hitting it less. And uh, so we can rank the um, customers in order of um, how likely we think they're going to uh, be open to upsell opportunity. Um, similarly, we want to predict device failure. Right? If um, a router is starting to go bad, we would like to be able to contact the customer and replace the router before they start having problems and having outages because having these problems and outages might cause them to churn. Um, so in conclusion, um, we saw that machine learning can help us make numeric predictions or classification predictions. It can also help us understand our data. And um, 
these other use cases, finding anomalies in the data and clustering, are uh, available to us, but they're outside the scope of this talk. Um, we also saw that uh, machine learning depends on having clean historical example data, right? That means that the data doesn't have um, a lot of errors in it, um, a lot of mistakes in it, and that it has the uh, historical answers that we want to extract the patterns for. We um, often need to prep the data, so we saw examples of that with joining the data and um, aggregating some of these uh, interactions that the customer had um, into counts. And we can often answer different questions from the same set of data. In all of this, it's really important how we frame the problem and um, understand how it'll fit into the business. And when we frame the problem, we want to understand how we're going to measure our success. So looking forward just a little bit, the next two sessions um, are going to be about the modeling workflow, um, all the steps that we go through and the cycle that we go through in developing machine learning models. We're going to talk about feature engineering and feature selection, model tuning, and how this all comes together into one uh, integrated workflow. Um, in the last session, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we're going to cover some of the problems that you can run into and make sure that you're on the lookout for these while you're doing your machine learning projects. Um, because if you're on the lookout for them, most of them are pretty easy to avoid. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about tools that can help you do that. All right, well, thanks for listening. Um, before we go, a couple other things. I'd like to give you a little bit of homework. So um, before we get to the next session, please uh, take a few minutes and think about your use cases, what data you have available, what data in your company you might have available, and what kind of things you might want to predict or understand about the data. You know, numeric prediction, classification, um, you know, true and false classification, or more than two classes. Um, we'll talk about these all more in the next two sessions, but it's great to spend a little time and think through this so that you have a little more context to understand our next two sessions. Finally, um, please join us for a short survey. I'd love to hear your feedback. And um, that's it for today. Thank you very much. Hope to see you in the next sessions.